So we've learned about simple harmonic motion when the spring only has the force of uh, the spring or when the mass only has the force of the spring. So you've got an auxiliary equation in the simple harmonic motion case. You've got the auxiliary equation of mx prime prime, that's the resultant force, force equals ma, um, plus k times x equals zero, no forcing function right now. And that gives us an auxiliary equation, m lambda squared uh, plus k is equal to zero, and we get um, purely imaginary eigenvalues, and so our solution is just pure trig, C1 cos omega t plus C2 sine omega t, and the, the spring just oscillates forever, up and down, up and down, up and down. We criticize that as not being realistic because we know when we perturb a spring that it can oscillate, but then it eventually dies down. What are we missing? We're missing friction. So we're going to make an assumption. We're going to add in friction. So I'm going to add it in as a force, just like we added in the uh, force of the spring. But we're making the assumption that the force of friction, force of friction, is proportional to velocity. So there's our C, our proportionality constant, or that C is the coefficient of friction. And x prime is our velocity. x prime would be like a dx dt. It's our, a speed, a velocity. Better way to say it, it's velocity. And friction is always poor, is always pushing. Uh, opposite velocity. It's always slowing us down. So if I'm going this way, friction's pointing negative of where I'm going. If I'm going this way, friction's pointing negative of where I'm going. So the force of friction is minus C x prime. And I just threw it in here with the rest of the forces or with the spring force. We had F equals ma, our resultant force, is equal to We've got minus kx, that was our spring force, Hooke's law, uh, that we had in the simple harmonic motion case, and I've added this additional force on the mass of friction. When we move this all over to the uh, other side, getting our second order linear constant coefficient homogeneous differential equation, so homogeneous, right now we're not assuming any forcing function, but we've got m x prime prime plus c x prime plus k x. All of these constants, m is the mass, c is the coefficient of friction, k is the spring constant, they're all positive. All the spring uh, model systems that we do will look like this. If it's, it's zero, if there's no forcing function, it's a homogeneous equation. Or if there's a forcing function, an outside function, something not accounted for by friction or the spring, someone jiggling the mass or something like that, poking it with a stick, then that goes on this side, that's the forcing function. But whether there's a forcing function there or not, the auxiliary equation is always our m lambda squared plus c lambda plus k. So then we always have eigenvalues. I pop this in the quadratic equation, and I get the equation for our eigenvalues. They're always this case. Let's do an example, and then we'll investigate um, the different kinds of eigenvalues. But most of the time, these will be presented, these problems will be word problems presented as such. Oh, and as we're reading through the question to see you know, how to solve this, remember that in our problem, there's only three things that I'm looking for. What's the mass? What's the coefficient of friction? what's the uh, spring constant, and is there any forcing function. That'll give me the differential equation. Then I need some initial conditions. It's second order, so I'm going to need two initial conditions. I'm going to need the initial position, and I'm going to need the initial velocity. Let's read through this problem then. we got a spring with a spring constant of 2. All right. They've already just outright told me that k is equal to 2. Is submerged in a fluid where the force of friction is thrice, three times, velocity. So now I know that the C, the coefficient of friction, is 3. On the spring is a 1 kilogram mass. All right, so the mass is 1. Now I know all the constants, the M and the C and the K. The mass is being shaken by an outside force of 2T minus 1. There's the forcing function. Write the differential equation that models the spring and solve it. All right, well, we know the 
mass is 1. So I'm going to get x prime, 1 times x prime prime. I'll put the 1 in here for pedagogical purposes. Plus 3 times x prime, there's friction. Plus 2 times x, there's the force of the spring, is equal to our outside or our forcing function. There's some kind of outside force on it. There's the differential equation. And solve it. Now, I know what I need to do to solve it. Um, I need the auxiliary equation. I get with the auxiliary equation, I get the eigenvalues. With the eigenvalues, I get the homogeneous solution. And then I add to it the particular solution. We know two different ways to get the particular solution, variation of parameters and unknown coefficients. For a line, I'm going to use unknown coefficients because I think it's easier. So we have a plan. We only then, we'll get two constants. Do they give us any, um, do they give us any indication of the initial condition? They, they don't. They don't tell us anything about the initial condition. So I won't have to find the constants for this, the two constants. How could they have given us information? Well, they could have said something like released from rest. If it's released, then in initially when we just let it go, it's not going, it's not moving. So x prime naught would equal to zero. And released from, they'd have to release it from, you know, one meter above or one meter below. That'll give us our x naught equals. So they can tell us that sort of information they didn't in this case. So now it's just a matter of solve this differential equation. The words are over. So let's get our, let's get our uh, auxiliary equation because I need to get the eigenvalues to solve for the homogeneous So here we've got our eigenvalues of minus 1 and minus 2. They're both real eigenvalues. Oh, real eigenvalues. That means there's no oscillation. Because the way to get oscillation is to have trig, and the way to get trig is to have complex conjugate eigenvalues. I've got real eigenvalues. We're going to call this later over damp. There's so much friction that the mass is not oscillating. It's just getting pulled straight down to equilibrium. So we know what our homogeneous equation is, our homogeneous, sorry, solution is. So now I just need to get my particular solution and my target function for my particular solution is this line. So I'm going to pick the most general line, AT plus B, plus B. And I'm going to need um, X I'm going to need to differentiate that once and twice because I need to sub it in here, second derivative, first derivative. So uh, the first derivative of that is A, and the second derivative is 0. So when I sub that into the left-hand side here, I get 0 plus 3A plus 2 times AT plus B. Equals uh, 2T minus 1, because I'm supposed to be getting the target function. That tells me that, so the coefficient in front of T is going to be 2A, so it's 2 on this side. That tells me that A has to be 1. If A is 1, Now I'm looking at the, the, coefficient, the, the coefficients without t's in front of them. And, oh, I know a is 1, so I'm just going to make it 1. So that tells me that b should be uh, minus 2. So then our particular solution is equal to t minus 2, so our general solution, or the solution, is equal to our homogeneous solution plus our particular solution. Now, again, 
if they would have given me some initial conditions, then I could have figured out what the C's were. But we solved the problem. Notice, too, that the homogeneous solution, because those two eigenvalues are negative, the homogeneous solution dies away eventually, or as t goes to infinity, regardless of what the c's are, and you're just sort of left with the homogeneous solution. So this would be an example of what we're going to call overdamped. Let's look at the three cases. Why are there three cases? Three cases in general. Well, you're always getting... For all spring questions, you're always getting the same auxiliary equation. So you're always getting the same uh, formula for eigenvalues, basically the quadratic equation with m, c, and k put in it. And so what kind of equation you get or what kind of solution you get, well, we've got the standard three different kinds. Eigenvalues are real and different, like in the case in the example we just did. Eigenvalues are real and the same, or eigenvalues are complex conjugate. Complex conjugate, that's going to mean trig. That's going to give us our oscillations that we would expect with a, when we think about a spring. But sometimes a spring can be so, uh, so stiff that it doesn't oscillate. In this case, there's... Oh, actually, let's not say that. It's not the spring that's so stiff. It's that the friction is so much that it doesn't oscillate back and forth. It just dies down to equilibrium. So the auxiliary equation of any spring problem is this m lambda squared plus uh, c lambda plus k. The m and the c and the k are positive. And then the eigenvalues are always given by this formula, the quadratic formula. So I've got the three cases. Now what if friction is, um, what if it's, well we'll call it, it's underdamped. We're going to have three different kinds of damped. Underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped. Underdamped means there's not enough friction, so c squared is smaller than 4mk, so there's a negative underneath the square root sign. A negative underneath, underneath the square root sign means imaginary uh, complex conjugate eigenvalues, that means trig. So we know that we get trig, we get some oscillations. Uh, let's take a look at this. Now what have I done here to, if, if this thing under the square root sign is negative, then I'm factoring out a negative of the thing inside the square root sign. I'm factoring out a negative. So now it's positive. So we got the square root of this. I'm just looking at that uh, square rooty thing. Where's my square root? There it is. That ain't it. And there's the square root of minus 1, which turns into the i. So I did this sort of algebra here to factor out the i. That's why this c squared is on the other side. It's going to be, put that over there, if I factor out the minus 1. So it's the 4mk minus c squared. Now this is positive, and this square root of minus 1 becomes the i. That's what happens here. If it's underdamped, there's a negative underneath the square root sign, then my eigenvalues have a real part and an imaginary part. Notice the real part is always negative, so the solutions will always oscillate and die away to zero. This imaginary part, sometimes in physics we'll call omega, and we know that we can have a period. The period is going to be uh, 2 pi divided by this omega, 2 pi divided by we would just say 2 pi divided by the imaginary part of the eigenvalue. That's if I have a negative underneath the square root sign. What if I have a positive underneath the square root sign? Like we had in our example, then we'll get two real and different eigenvalues. That's the overdamped case. There's so much friction that it's not oscillating. It's just getting pulled down and slow. it's getting slowed down to, uh, so that it doesn't uh, oscillate back and forth. It might, it might, depending on initial conditions, shoot through the equilibrium once, but then it'll just come back up towards the equilibrium. So overdamped. Oh, I also want to point out, we had here that the, in the underdamped case with the complex conjugate eigenvalues, the real part of the eigenvalue was negative. We could see that from the formula. In the overdamped case, the eigenvalues are both 
real, but they're also both negative. Now, the minus c minus the square root thing, obviously that one's negative, but what about the minus 3 plus the square root thing? Is that one negative? Um, short answer, yes. Why? Well, we're taking minus c and we're adding something to it. What are we adding to it? Well, the square root of c squared minus a little bit. c squared minus a little bit is less than c squared. The square root of something less than c squared is less than c, so minus c plus something less than c is still negative. So both eigenvalues are negative. If it's overdamped, the homogeneous solution still goes to zero. It just doesn't oscillate to zero. So underdamped and overdamped, the which one is it, is really determined by the sign of the thing under the square root sign. If it's a negative under the square root sign, complex conjugate roots, we have underdamped oscillation. If it's a positive underneath the square root sign, then we've got real and different eigenvalues. Overdamped, there's so much friction, it's overdamped. What if the thing under the square root sign is exactly equal to zero? We call that critically damped. In that case, the eigenvalues, there's two real and the same eigenvalues. They're both, well, they're both negative. So this, the, this what? The homogeneous solution, again, still goes to zero. So in all cases, the homogeneous solution goes to zero since the real parts of the eigenvalues are negative. So the general solution always approaches the particular solution.